let's get started. So uh, first, I just want to tell you a little bit about me, because um, I'm technically I'm head of growth now at Templify. Been that for a month. So <laughs> I've been with Templify for almost three years now. So uh, I used to run all our paid advertising and also be a little bit of a growth hacker on the side, which is kind of why I'm here. Um, I like to call myself a self-declared expert. I've taken some YouTube videos and some courses online, and that's how I got here. So um, that's how most people get here. They don't take MBAs or stuff like that. So <laughs> uh, I'm also a huge nerd. I'm uh, really good at chess, and I play a lot of video games and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I have a little kid, just like Stefan. He's just 15 months, so I have a little bit more experience in that department. <laughs> and also, I like to use emojis a lot, because they're really cool. So OK. Uh, we're gonna be uh, we're gonna do a lot of cool things today. Uh, I just want to start out by saying this is what I'm gonna cover. I'm just gonna give you really briefly just a really context slide, just to give you an idea of my journey, uh, how I got into growth, and a little bit a slide on what Templify does, so you can kind of get an idea on that. I'm gonna talk a little bit about metrics today. This is something I haven't talked about a lot in the past, so I'm gonna talk a little bit very in depth on how we use metrics and how some of the metrics I wish I would have known from the start. Uh, then I'm going to use a, a case that I did for Templify back in 2018, and which is still very much applicable. And lastly, I'm going to give you some of the key tips I have for this whole growth data mindset. Okay, let's get started. So I used to work in sales for seven years, and I like to believe that a good growth hacker should have the sales psychology. So what I mean with that is just saying, every, every time you interact with someone in marketing, you always interact with people, right? So people think, so when you work in sales, you know what they trigger off. So when I do ads, I can always tell, I can, my gut feeling can tell me, and I know I don't trust gut feeling, we'll, we'll get to that part, but essentially my gut feeling can tell me if this is gonna work or not, because I know people. So um, working, I've been working cold calls, which is the best learning ever, but also very hard. I uh, have parents in marketing, a marketing high school, a 90 kid, I played a lot of issues. But one of the things I learned from my 90s time was that uh, back in the day, there was no, like Google was barely a thing. So you had to solve all these issues yourself. And this mindset thing is something I've taken with me onto growth. I think uh, in the traditional growth versus marketing setup, it's really important to understand that typical marketeers only work in a little bit in silos. It's not like they work in this like little silo in their own department, but a lot of this, in, to a large extent, a lot of marketeers work with awareness and acquisition. That's kind of where they fit in. When you talk about growth on a large scale, and when I do growth, I talk about full funnel. So I look at the full funnel, and what does that actually mean? I'll, I hope you get an idea of that by me showing this. So essentially, what I'm, I believe that if you're a really good growth hacker, you're somewhat in between this marketing sales psychology. You have this data mindset of testing, and you have a really good idea of scripts, and you have idea of the technical side of it. You don't have to be the coding expert. I know a little HTML. I know a little Java and stuff like that. But you don't have to be an expert on these things. You just have to know enough that you can piece the pieces together. All right. A little piece about Templify. So Templify solves. Uh, a really big issue for a lot of big companies. So every day, uh, you probably all worked in a company where people produce a lot of documents, a lot of assets and presentations, emails and stuff. And then they want to say, hey, I want to use the latest logo. And then they go and Google it or something. It's horrible, right? The same, same thing with like, hey, they have a sales presentation. And they go like, hey, Karsten, do you have the presentation from 2012? It's awesome. It's not really up to date. It's using the wrong colors and all this stuff. So Templify solves that by being inside of your Microsoft Office platforms. So right inside of PowerPoint and Word and stuff like that, you have the task pane in the side. And you can ask, ask, uh, have access to all the materials you need from your company and control centrally. So we solve what we call document anarchy. And essentially, for a context base, and this is like my mindset, I work out for, the, uh, I work out for two different personas, typically. So I, I work out for what I call brand managers. So brand managers have the problem of saying, hey, we have to control the brand globally for a big company with 50,000 employees. You can imagine uh, going uh, 50,000 employees sending an email, hey, guys, can you please update your email signature? It's not really happening. <laughs> so, so most of these people have never had a tool to solve these things. So these are very, it's a good weight in the door. At the same time, there's a lot of senior IT people, people who work with digital transformation specifically. They have to take their whole big companies and move them up to the new age, and Templify is part of that, part of that ecosystem. Okay, typically, also saying Templify is better with bigger companies. And just simply put, it's just to say that with bigger companies, the problem is bigger. 
So it makes a lot of sense. Okay, I want, I want to talk a little bit about metrics here. So um, one part of today is that I want to talk about the things I would have loved to know when I started out doing marketing, doing gro growth in general. So first I want to start about talking about a little bit about the EDA model. It's the only model I'm going to show you today, but it's also the only model you'll probably ever need. So I know Nikolai, he touched upon in the beginning and saying people have a tendency to focus on the bottom of the funnel um, initially and focus too much on it. And I, don't get me wrong, that can also be correct. But actually, I, I always recommend to say, the first thing you should always do when you test out if your channel or anything works for you is saying, how can I get to the people who are ready to buy my product right now the fastest? And I know that you can always do these PR campaigns and you can start top funnel, you can do really cool things, but these things take time. So, and especially for something like Templify, where the typical sales cycle is between four and six months, I don't have time for people to move down the funnel for one and a half years plus six months before they actually convert, because then we're out of money, like, or at least we were back then. So, so that's not really happening. So whenever I advise people, I always say like, hey, start with the people who are ready to buy your product. Let's say somebody searches for template management solution for enterprises. That guy is pretty ready to buy Templify, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> he, he's, he might only be one guy every year that does that, but that one guy, I really want to get to that guy. So, and then after a while, you get to like, okay, people who search for PowerPoint online. They don't really understand template management, but at some, to some extent, they might also be in the sphere. And typically, what I've seen, and I've actually we've proven this a lot with the data, is that whenever we do advertise that are broader and do Facebook and LinkedIn stuff, it's more top funnel, and there's tendency that the mindset of the whole organization is not always ready to buy. So we see that search-based stuff is typically the ones that convert faster. That makes a lot of sense. It's tip, like it's super rational. The thing about search-based stuff, it's pretty hard to scale it sometimes. Like you can find that one guy who does template management solutions for enterprise. You can't find a second one because it doesn't exist. So, so the point is, start, you, it's really good to start at the bottom, at the mindset. And once there might only be 10 people there, but those 10 people you really want to get to, especially if you have a really high lifetime value. All right, let's move on. So um, I know this is a super rhetorical question. I'm really sorry. But <laughs> I, have, I, have an, I, have, like, I don't feel people talk enough about this. Simply put, why does marketing exist? To generate sales. Yes, we want to sell a product. That's why we do what I do, and that's why I exist. And why do we talk about the other things that don't matter then? Like, why, why, we, why do we consistently talk about these things? So, hey, uh, I did this campaign, and I had uh, 5,000 likes, and I got shared and commented on, and like, okay, how did you sell your product? Yeah, I sold one. Uh, okay, cool. How much did you spend? Like, five million. It doesn't matter. It's, it doesn't really matter. Like, um, I, I had, typically, I use this example of saying, um, I had a guy come up to me when I was like, hey, it's like, yeah, we had a really good successful video campaign. I was like, okay, cool, cool. How, how did you go? Yeah, we got the five, I think it was 500,000 impressions. So like, okay, cool, how, how good. So how long did they watch? I didn't watch for three seconds. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> like, three seconds of Templify, you don't understand Templify in three seconds, no hard feelings. But you really, typically you don't. So these metrics are technically bullshit. So what you want to focus on is closed one MRR, monthly recurring revenue. That's what matters. And the hard part is finding out how to do that. So here's a really good point. Uh, so I, I actually had to dig into my old Google AdWords account because we've, this is a humble brag, but <laughs> we've gotten so good at this that we don't actually do this anymore. But in the beginning, we had issues with identifying the, the keywords that actually mattered in search terms. I know it can be really hard to see because it's pretty small, but essentially, when people search for easy handyman estimates created templates, Yes, it has templates in it, but they're probably not looking for Templify solution. You might be paying a lot because these people actually converted. For some reason, they converted when they came to our site and thought, hey, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> I can tell you it wasn't. <laughs> it really wasn't. And that's the thing. So if you only trust these platforms and say, hey, I'm only cost per conversion for this campaign or this campaign, it doesn't really matter. Like, it actually really doesn't matter. Yes, it's a different world in e-commerce. So I, I don't want to talk too much about that. I'm not an expert on e-commerce. But in B2B, this is not what matters. Lead quality matters. The actual one co close customers, those matter. These platforms, watch out. Like, don't, don't trust them fully heartedly. All right. So how, how do we actually do this if we have want to apply this mentality to the real world? Um, so I want to talk about one thing first. 
So a lot of startups, and I've even I've talked with Sean Ellis about this and stuff, they talk about all, all these North Star metrics. And I love the North Star metric, um, but there's a fallacy about it. And I really want to talk about that before I move on a little bit. So does anyone, does it, who doesn't know the North Star metric, what it is as a concept? Okay, fair enough. So essentially, the North Star metric is this one metric that can unify your company. So whenever you increase this metric, you increase everything that's good for your company. So in the case of Airbnb or in the case of Facebook, it's daily active users, number of nights booked, and so forth. So you always want to identify this, this key metric that you can improve. That's really good. That's a really good starting point. And if you, want, if you have done that for your company, you're really far ahead. The thing is, it's also a bit of a scapegoat. So I see a lot of startups that go like, yeah, man, uh, we had uh, uh, a thousand users create their profiles. Okay, cool, but have you sold anything? Not yet, but it's, it's supposed to be the right metric for us. It's like, okay, it doesn't really matter yet. So initially, actually, we just adopted our North Star metric for real this month. Like, this is the first month we're actually gonna try and run it in growth experiments where we run with the North Star metric. And the reason for this is that we weren't mature enough to do it before. So I'm just saying that when you do these things and when you think about North Star Magic, just make sure that you're not using it as a scapegoat for not explaining the real value. So if you're saying, like, let's say you do a product where it's about users and generating users who make a profile or something. Well, they have to buy your product. At some point, they have to get up their wallet. That's the point that matters initially. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a good example. So typically, when I see marketeers, they go and say, Hey, Casper, I got this amount of leads for my organization. Okay, cool. I just want to make up, these are some made up numbers because I didn't want to show you the real ones. But, but it's, the point, point is still very true. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, and then there's a little old too and stuff. But, <laughs> but, but, but the point is still very accurate. So, uh, the idea is here that when you go to other companies, the first thing they do is say like, hey, Casper, uh, I got f 45 MQLs and 65 SQLs or whatever, whatever. So they got, got some qualified leads. That is good, and don't get me wrong, that's a very good metric of saying, are, are we doing well or are we doing not doing well? So let's take a look at this and say, and say okay, based on this alone, what, what channel seems to be performing the best? Well, you would say like, hey, LinkedIn, that seems to be performing pretty well because it's provided, uh, what is it, 12 amount, 12 qualified leads versus the 25 in total leads that came in. Okay, that's more qualified leads than from any other, other channels. Okay, typically your agency would stop there. And they're like, there you go, Casper, hand me a million. So that's not the case though. That's not how it works in real life. So we have to de dive even deeper. So let's, let's do this one instead. So would this normally satisfy you? And typically a lot of people stop here, like 90% and maybe it's just 50% in here, but 90% <laughs> but of the people I talk to, they go like, yeah, my cost per qualified lead went down this month. Like, okay, good for you. Like, it doesn't really matter, right? Because that, that's essentially the point. Cost per qualified lead, for instance, does not, is not revealing the actual truth of if you're performing or not. That's only the thing you look at when you look at Facebook, when you look at Google Ads and stuff. That's where it stops. No, the thing you want to evaluate on is essentially this. You want to say, how much for me does it cost for me to achieve one kroner of opportunity MRR? So what is an opportunity? An opportunity is someone who's a... And you can define this in many different ways. You can call it an opportunity, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Doesn't really matter, it's just technicality. The point is, an opportunity is someone, in our case, that's already had a demo and is pretty far down and saying, like, we want to buy the product to some extent. Because imagine this, when they come in initially, the first thing they do is say, oh, hey, Casper, I just signed up, I come from a 50,000 company, and uh, I have the right job title. So we go like, hey, a lead scoring is awesome, this is the perfect person, I really want to sell to this person. And then the sales guy goes like, this is gonna be worth a fortune. And he talks to him and the guy goes, yeah, I have this uh, 50 man team that needs to simplify. So like, okay, it's probably not worth a lot. So there's a lot of difference in how you score them initially. So you have to get to a point where you can actually score this precisely. And that takes a while. So once you get to this point where you can say, okay, now how much does this actually cost? So every time I put a kroner in LinkedIn, I get 4.7 kroners out of it. Every time I put a kroner in Facebook, I get two point zero seven kroners out of it, right? So there's a difference here, and that's a really important distinction. This is where you can actually see the true value of what you're doing in marketing. So of course, it's very interesting to look at closed one, actual closed customers, but sometimes, especially in a case like Templify, these are super volatile. You can close a deal one day from one channel, and then that channel looks amazing, and then you go like the next day, and like, okay, it's actually not that good. 
we initially we had a really fun case where we used Keptera. Keptera is one of these uh, review platforms for soft software. In the first month of using it, this is two years old or something. In the first month of using it, we closed a customer. It was like, what? That's never happened before. And then we didn't close anything for a year. So, <laughs> so we were like, the first month, we were like, ah, oh, it's awesome, it's awesome. And then we like, just kept dropping, kept dropping, kept dropping. So the point of these things is to say, like, focus on the things that actually matter. Of course, we, uh, like, if I did it today and closed the customer who kept tear the first month, I, was all, I, would, all, like, I would still continue. <laughs> but it's just to saying that these numbers can deceive you. So just be aware of that. All right. So now we can actually op optimize after real value. So let me give you another example of how I actually practically do this uh, when we do uh, kind of value. I'm going to use Google Ads as an example. We've done, you can do similar things for Facebook, and you can do similar things for LinkedIn and stuff. It just works differently. So uh, and, and Stefan can probably talk even more about how you do these attribution things. So, um, so on Google Ads, there's something called a G-clit. Awful name, I didn't come up with it, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's called, uh, it's really like, I want to turn this off, I don't really need. So I'm really sorry, it's called G-clit. Um, but the point is, it's a unique identifier for when you use Google Ads. So every single time you click on an ad in Google Ads, it has something called a G-clit. The thing about those G-clits, so this is uh, uh, this case I'm showing up here is a HubSpot form. We use HubSpot here. We use different platforms in the past. We use HubSpot. So HubSpot, you can set up a field in your form that automatically picks up on this G-clit. So what you, you can also pick up client ID, which is also unique, which is also something you can use for tracking and analytics. But that's not the point of this one. So the G-clit is unique. So what do you do with the G-clit? So typically, when you optimize for Google Ads, you say, OK, Google, here's uh, what I want to bid on. Here's the keywords I'm bidding on. And you can see Google sends some traffic to your website. Then that uh, website is handled by Google Analytics. It tells you, hey, blah, blah, you're doing blah, blah, blah on this platform. And then you have your CRM system or your marketing automation, HubSpot, you use Salesforce as well, that tells you something about, OK, did something actually happen here? What's the problem with this solution? Does anyone have an idea? I'm just teasing. OK, so the problem with this solution is that the Tra the traffic between Google Ads and Salesforce does not act accurately show what's happening. So let's say that someone goes in and Google Ads and writes, uh, yeah, a good example we've been having lately is, uh, or we had initially, we haven't, don't have it much anymore, but we had these PowerPoint online. A lot of people would search for PowerPoint online, which wouldn't really be what we're kind of solving, but still in the ballpark of what we're looking at, and they would convert a lot. The thing is just they wouldn't become customers. They would not become customers because their mindset was just wrong. And how do you, so what you optimize, and in Google, normally when you go for Google, it goes like, okay, Google, can you optimize for where it gets the most conversions? And it's like, hey, this PowerPoint online, it's really great. Just invest all your money here. It's totally wrong, right? So what you want to do is you can actually feed this G-clit information to your Salesforce and then feed it from Salesforce back into Google Analytics and back into Google Ads. And then you can tell, okay, I want, to, I want to actually optimize towards the ones that have generated value based on the different stages. So this keyword that has generated opportunity, MRR, monthly recurring revenue value, that's the keyword I want to optimize towards. So that's what we do. And that's really, that's really when you get close enough to saying, OK, now we actually optimize towards, towards what we know should be working, or what we know is working. OK. <clears throat> So I, I decided to throw in a quote. I'm usually not a big fan of quotes, but here we go. <laughs> so one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. So the reason I decided to throw this in is because of this guy. So can anyone tell me who this guy is? It's a stock image, so, so just <laughs> think. <laughs> OK, so this guy is your CFO. He is now your best friend. The reason he's your best friend is because by the end of the year, he's the one who goes like, oh, Casper, how much did you earn this year in marketing? And we're like, yeah, I don't really know, typically. But now we can say, hey, uh, and our CEO is called yeah, Jacob, big fan of Seaster. But yeah, so Jacob, he'll go like, oh, Casper, how much did you earn this year? And go like, more than dated. <laughs> and then he goes like, OK, cool. So how do you divide the budgets? I want more than they do. And that's really easy. And then he becomes your best friend, right? And suddenly, you're actually optimizing towards these really cool things. And your CFO, every year, he goes like, can you spend more next year? And you're like, yeah, I can probably do that. I can probably figure out a way. 
I just want to point out, it's actually not a lot. It's not easy to spend more and more every every year. It's actually really hard, but we can talk about that's another point. Okay, so now I want to show you a really case I did. Um, I together with my team, but uh, I did initially in 2018. Uh, so it's a bit it's a bit old, but it's, it actually shows exactly my point of the whole thing of this. Okay, so how many of you have used something called lead gen forms before on Facebook, LinkedIn? You can even do a YouTube, we tried that too. Uh, we can also do Google these days. You can do a lot of different things. Okay, so only a few of you. So just the basics here. So a, a lead form, a lead gen form, is a form that appears when somebody clicks an ad, and then it's uh, accurately pre-filled with information based on your profile. On these platforms, it's LinkedIn, where it's very accurate. On Facebook, it's less accurate. And typically, the good part about this is it's very frictionless. There's not a lot of friction when you do these things. So when you click on these forms, they autofill, and you have a higher conversion rate to actually get their email and stuff like that. It's really powerful. What's the catch? The catch is that it's really typically hard to convert these people. And if you think about it, it makes total rational sense. It's like knowledge about your product is limited to say the very least. People click on this, and I don't expect them to know Templify after seeing my ad, which is probably a basic image, not even a video for 10 seconds or whatever, clicking on and signing up for a demo. I don't expect that they fully grasp what Templify is about at this stage. So there's a low commitment, and sometimes you even get people, hey, I really don't know what I clicked on, <laughs> an accident, and blah, 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 all these things. The thing is, they convert, like there's a lot more conversions initially than typically website-led conversions, where you send them to a website and they convert through that. So there's reason to the madness, but you have to, you have to do something about it. So we had, we had the issue here initially that our lead to conversion rate between these uh, to book meeting was dropping really hard. Like, and back in end of January 2018, it was less than 10%, which uh, is hard for me to explain, but it was pretty critical. It was not, not amazing. So I had an idea, epiphany, eureka moment, or I don't know, something. The next part is probably the eureka moment. But <laughs> what if we could actually personalize these approaches and educate the leads before they reach a sales rep? So typically, the sales rep would get them, and then we're like, hey, I don't know what it is, blah, blah, blah. What if you can actually say, at least they knew Templify before we got them on the phone automatically? All right, so I decided to pull again, pull in a bunch of different tools. So this is the first step I did where I said, okay, we have LinkedIn or Facebook, doesn't really matter for your form. And technically, this doesn't matter for wherever you use it, it's just to showcase that this is what I use in this case. Then I use Drift. So Drift is uh, our chatbot system for our website. I really like Drift for B2B companies because it's more, it's way better for lead generation. It's not good for if you have a platform where it's about user interaction, I would recommend Intercom in that case. But typically for B2B lead generation, it's by far the best. It's also quite expensive. But <laughs> we use 23 as our video hub and I use Sapier to tie it all together. And back then we used Salesforce Pardot and if there's one learning from today, is please don't use that. <laughs> so, uh, but so nowadays we use HubSpot. But it's just to say that we use a bunch of different systems and the whole idea is how we tie them all together. Okay. So first thing we did was uh, we said, okay, cool, let's make a bunch of really cool ads. Everyone can do this part. I'm not really going to depth of this part. You can make a bunch of different ads to different audiences and stuff like that. That's not a part of this. So we made a bunch of really cool lead ads and you can see it's hard to see on these pictures, but essentially what a lead ad here is, there's a small button below the ad where they click and then they're frictionless sign up, right? And all of these ads say, hey, you can get a demo. I want you to talk to me. I want you to actually, I want to show you my product. Then we embedded the automatics and we set it up the flow. So it automatically got embedded videos uh, with these personalized videos. It's hard. It's fine. Yeah. So essentially what Danny says is just, hey, uh, you're a marketing professional, thanks for signing up, blah, blah, blah. The thing is, he doesn't actually say their name. I know this is back in 2018 and we were just getting started on all this. Now these days you can do stuff like Bombora and really cool Bonjoro and not Bombora, Bonjoro. Other cool things, you can even use three for actually this part today where you can actually automate the part where they say the, say the name and hold up signs, stuff like that. So you can do it more advanced today, but this is what we did back then. Okay, so we made it personal. 
And then we made these, these emails. So the first email would seem very professional and like, hey, this comes from Templify, uh, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for signing up. Here's a video about Templify. And then quite a day after, we get a personal video with a, a personal uh, email with, and the important thing was there was no HTML in these, in these secondary and third emails. Because we wanted it to seem like it was from real, actual people. So Danny actually seemed like he wrote this and did this personal video for them, right? And you can see, uh, it's hard to see on the screen here, but on the third email, it really looks like something Danny could have written. It's not that good at writing, but almost. But, <laughs> but um, the thing is, the second thing is, like the fourth thing we did was, now we, now we had these beautiful emails, now we need to hit the right people. So we generated the video you saw here, we generated a bunch of these different videos. We said, hey, uh, IT professional, hey, or marketing professional, or hey, you're a marketing manager, or blah, 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 all these different job titles. Because we had really good data, in this case from LinkedIn, we could actually afford to segment it out. So this is an uh, image of when we use Pardot, please don't use it. And, <laughs> and we segmented it out. So what it first does is it kind of separates them into countries and say what countries are represented, we could send it out to the different BDRs. Then within each country, we separate it out into different job titles and job functions. And then, then we get specific flows based on this. It's quite like it sounds, it sounds advanced, but it's really simple. Like it's actually not that hard. Like, and you can do this. I did it alone, took me some time, but, but it's really quite easy. There's a bunch of different flows. It's like this is just to give you an idea so how it looks, but there's a bunch of different flows just similar to this. So then, you, then we made the, all the people, these are new pictures. I didn't want to show the old ones because they were real bad. But, <laughs> but, but uh, we made these personal Drift bots uh, pages. So that's one of the cool things about Drift is that people become, it becomes very personal. This, this whole communication chatbot wave of, of, of selling and doing marketing. I love it. I'm a big fan of it. So we made all these. So when people actually in, like, interacted with our emails, they would get to these personal sites with these different bots. And then we, so you can see here, here's a good example. So this is, and again, this is an old picture for showing how it was back then. So back then, it was actually like this. You came to our site. We changed our website, that's what I'm saying right now. So uh, back, back then, you would come to our website, and then you would have a personal bot that would come like, hey, uh, hey there, I'm Danny's personal assistant. Would you like to book a time with him? So now the thing is, now you're already in the conversation of saying you want to book some a meeting, and you're at the same time, you're on our website. So you're looking around, saying like, okay, what am I actually booking a demo for? It's really good. Then we linked it all together. These days, you don't actively need that all the time. If you have HubSpot, you don't. If you have Pardot, you really do. But you can use Sapier to link all your stuff together. And, and I love Sapier, and it's probably, if you ever have to invest in a tool you want to learn, this is probably one of them. All right, so what happened? Did, did anything cool happen? Yes, of course it did. Uh, so, uh, so we got some really cool responses or some really cool things. So, hey, Danny, thanks for your know. If you want to schedule a time to hear your pitch, let me know if you have any availability and blah, blah, blah. Discuss and I'll coordinate with my team. Awesome. You have to remember, Danny has not touched a single part of this. Like, I've started an ad campaign that's automatically flown it right into his Monday morning meeting with this guy, or whatever it is. Uh, hey, Danny, sorry for not getting back earlier. Hey, Danny, I'll try to connect next week, next week. So we got a lot of really cool responses back on this. At the same time, this is when it got really cool. This is my personal eureka moment. I literally had a eureka moment where I shouted out in the whole office like, yes, <laughs> finally. Uh, it happened where it was like someone got all the email, the entire email flow, went to the personal bot of a guy called Jacob, and then they booked themselves in for a time slot back, this is, you can see here, back in 2000, end of 2018, where they booked themselves in for a time slot for a demo call. This is, I'm just telling you, this is cold traffic taken all the way from a lead ad to a demo. And you have to remember, for Templeye, we sell these products with a huge lifetime value. They're really, like, it's a big deal. We sell to clients with 50,000 employees. These are worth a lot. That's really cool. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was having fun. Okay. So, um, the cool thing about this is also that it does a lot of other things. So, one of the things we saw in our video hub uh, from 23, you can use Vistia, Vidya, or whatever you want to use, we use 23, so uh, is that the play rate was really high on these. Is that, it, like, when people saw these, they saw 80% or something of the videos. Of course, it differentiated a little bit from video for, to video, but overall, they got a pretty good idea of, uh, they saw all the videos, so it got really personal. I don't have it here, but the open rate on the, uh, the secondary email, so after the first personal video, was also very high. Very interesting. 
So here's a steep curve. But <laughs> essentially, what we ended up with was actually a result of saying we had a 150% increase in book meetings from LinkedIn by doing this, and we had a 43% drop in cost per opportunity, which is the one I said mattered, after a book meeting. And also, we moved most of our activities to lead forms, which ended up decreasing our cost per qualified lead by 55%. That's, I th I personally, I think that's really good. I don't know about you guys, but I think it's really good. So uh, actually, it was so good. We, I don't have it here, but we actually did a case study with LinkedIn because they're like, OK, we've never seen stuff like this before. It's really simple. It just, it, it just requires, like, it's not, it requires time. Like, some of these tools, yes, Drift is a little expensive, and HubSpot is probably also expensive for some people and stuff. But it's, it's not, those are not the tools that make this happen. Like, you can do this whatever tool you want to use, and it's just about thinking it through. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about, this is the kind of lightning round where I talk, I have four key learnings I wish someone would have told me when I started out doing this. So first of all, I want to talk about do things that don't scale. We've been uh, talking, this Devin talked about you want to scale things aggressively, and I really agree, totally, 100% agree. But when I started out initially, like uh, you don't always have to look, focus on, can it be scaled? Because sometimes you'll hit a wall and be like, okay, I can't really scale this actually, so I shouldn't do it? No, of course you should do it. Breakfast meetings, hyper targeted uh, account based marketing campaigns, personal videos for your best customers, stuff like this matters. Stuff like this initially is worth your time. And of course, you have to look for the found, find something that you can try to scale as hard as possible. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that at all, o quite the opposite. But it's okay to do things that don't scale tremendously. Um, good, really good example is so I introduced for Templify. Again, I did a lot of stuff in 2018. But <laughs> in 2018, I introduced uh, this personal uh, branding program for Templify. So every time someone starts a Templify, I give them a personal branding course on LinkedIn. One hour teaches everyone what they want to know about LinkedIn and everything. And I teach them all something about the algorithms, to teach them some of the tools you're not supposed to know, all that stuff. Anyways. LinkedIn did a little analysis, which happens when you pay them a lot of money. But LinkedIn did a small, cool analysis for us, where they actually found that in October of the month of 2018, so nine month, 10 months after we started the whole program, we actually generated more value. It's a bit of a vanity metric, but, but tech still, still does a lot of truth to it. Still provided more value than our paid advertising from the platform. So we had actually made each and every employee from Templify an ambassador of Templify, posting every week and doing all of these cool stuff and scratching each other's back. I'm not going to go into depth on how we did this, but just to say that was originally not thought out as a thing that was supposed to scale, but it kind of ended up doing, and it was really good. All right. So I want to talk about this because a lot of people uh, have a tendency to to leave their either to leave their gut or they only go with their gut. It's like uh, it's one way or the other. So I always go for data first. And it doesn't mean that I always look at the data and say, what can the data tell me? But some point, at some point in time, no matter how good we are at attribution, no matter how good tools we get, at some point you just have to say, and you have to sit down and make a decision and say, like, OK, I think this is the better option. And I've done that so many times. And in the beginning, I was like, OK, I would only trust the data. But as you can see here, if I only trusted Google Ads data initially, and I wasn't mentally prepared or hadn't done some of the exercises I've shown, I would have not gotten to where I am because like, those would have led me in the wrong direction. So data is not always true. So just be very clear on the fact that you follow, tr follow your data as much as you can, but keep your rational mind when you do it. And trust your gut feeling. If your gut feeling is telling you to spend all your money on display, don't do it. <laughs> okay. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about playing field. It's something I've been talking a bit about recently. Is that I say, today I see it as there's kind of two options. Either you go with the Facebook engine, so you go with uh, Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook platform for advertising. We're talking paid ads here. And, or you go for Google, YouTube, Google Ads, Gmail, and stuff like that. It's kind of like where I think it's 90% of all ad budgets go to either of those places, something like that. So it's kind of in the place where you're saying like there's not a lot of different options, but that's just because people are not looking. So one of the things I would have loved to learn when I started out is, is that a lack of diversity in your marketing portfolio is really dangerous, actually. A good example is we had a uh, month in January, I think it was last year. January last year, where for two, I think it was two and a half, three weeks, the, mark, the cost per lead of our LinkedIn stuff in quadrupled. So four times higher than normal. And it lasted for about two and a half to three weeks. 
Now, I have, uh, sometimes I have, uh, I have a boss who has a lot of ice in his gut. I don't always. <laughs> I try to, but sometimes. So I was really nervous, and we were almost one week away from just closing it. The problem is, if we had invested all our money into LinkedIn, this would be super bad, right? We would have a month where we're not generating good leads, and we'd have to put it somewhere else. So sometimes people go like, yeah, but I just want to have that one channel that performs well. It's good to have a bunch of different channels that performs well. Yes, some channel, in our case, Google Ads right now is one of the channels that paid-wise performs really well. Well, we put a lot of money into that part. But we're always ready to make the switch if Google someday go like, hey, guys, you're going to pay twice as much today. And we can make that switch really rapidly. I wish I would have known that back then, too. Something we've been trying, I've been trying all these platforms. Uh, okay, I haven't tried Pinterest, but, <laughs> but Pinterest for B2B. But you have to try some of these platforms because <laughs> people can be there. Like we sell a B2B products, so it's maybe not that relevant to be on Pinterest. But for some other people, these re platforms can be hugely relevant. And the thing about them is there's not a lot of competition. Like everyone is like going for the first thing, like, hey, I want to try Facebook. Or, and then when they're smart, they go, like, hey, I want to try LinkedIn. Like, okay, what about Quora or Reddit or Captera, Snapchat or whatever, whatever. Try the different platforms and see what works for your business because it might not be the same case for your brother or whatever. All right, last point of today. I just want to say this. I, I know I've, uh, I'm a bit of a growth hacker myself and I love doing hacks and love finding it, but the main thing about all these things is that strategy eats growth hacks for breakfast. If your strategy is not aligned with what you're doing when you're growth hacking, doing growth in general, you're doing it wrong. Simply put, there's no silver bullet. Like, I'm not, like, what I showed you here, yes, that was a cool thing, but there's a lot of stuff that got me to that point. I'm lucky enough to be in a company where Templify is an amazing product. It's a really good product. If our product wasn't good or our marketing strategy in general wasn't good, some of these things might still work, but it might not work that well, actually. So just remember that you have got to focus on your strategy, then you can start doing the really cool stuff. Doesn't mean you should not, never do cool stuff because people also go in the other boat and say, like, I'm only going to do PowerPoints from 9 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. That's not how you get to really good growth. But you have to find like, a stage where you say, OK, we have a really good strategy. How can we apply these hacks to this strategy? Cool. Thank you. If there's guides, slides, I have, you can just email me or find me on LinkedIn and stuff.